Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. It is February 1st, 2021. And on today's podcast, we have the coach of St. Thomas More Prep School in Connecticut, Jared Quinn on the line. Coach, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Um, you have something going outside, on outside your window right now. Tell, tell everyone what's going on with that. Oh, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the midst of a Northeaster. Uh, um, and it's actually kind of interesting because some of our kids from Florida have never seen this kind of snow. So they're absolutely amazed, but we already got about a foot and we may get up to about a foot and a half. So uh, Connecticut is intermittent with snow. So this is like a big thing. Gotcha. Now, I think a good cross training workout for your kids might be shoving your driveway for you. You thought of that? Well, I've, I've already pushed that out. And, you know, all <laughs> these guys, uh, 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 they're such big shots. And then you ask them to do something like that and they kind of back off. But uh, uh, we'll figure it out. We'll okay. figure it out. Well, well, let's let's start. It. It's, it's, not, it's not easy to shovel snow socially distance. Good point. So Good point. We'll, we'll go with it. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background and how you ended up to where you are today. Um, you were from Queens, New York originally, correct? Or no, yeah. Manhattan, right? No, Queens. 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 Flush, Queens. Flush and Queens. Flush and Queens. I'm a Queens guy. Gotcha. So That's why, right. when you were growing up, why basketball? I know you must have been a Mets fan living there. Oh, I actually used to go to the Mets fans all the time on board and milk coupons, but that's the board and milk used to do 50 for every quart of milk. You'd get a coupon and I have eight brothers and sisters. So we went through a lot of coupons. So I saw a lot of Met games. Uh, um, but now it's just, you know, I have eight brothers and sisters within nine years and we grew up uh, uh, up across the street from a park and everything was parks. And I, you know, my family was a big opponent of kicking people out till dinner. So we had to do something. So we played ball and I had a brother who's a year older and a brother who's a year younger. So, you know, as a family, we were always out there, but there's so many people in Queens who wanted to play ball. So it actually really worked well. Gotcha. And then tell me about your high school career. I played a school called Archbishop Malloy, which is, you know, a perennial powerhouse. And I played for a guy, Jack Curran, who is, you know, a legendary, le legendary coach and a very great disciplinarian and, and, uh, so I, I, I uh, actually, I was one of those kids that went to high school at 411, so I didn't have a chance right away. I grew, I grew late. So I made the team my freshman year, but I, then I was 5'3 and 5'6, sophomore, junior year. And then all of a sudden I did one of these five inch growing spurts. So I, at Malloy, I played my freshman year on the, on the freshman team and my senior year on the varsity team. Got cut my sophomore and junior year. And that's, back then you just played CYO which mm -hmm. unfortunately don't seem to have as much, but I probably played in those two years, maybe a hundred basketball games because they played on a couple of different CYO teams, which was a lot of fun. Do you use that same story Michael Jordan used about getting cut from his team? Does that, do you incorporate no, that in coaching? No, because I, I try not to compare my game to his. So, so if getting cut from a team allows me to get into coaching, then I'm okay. <laughs> not that I'm the Michael Jordan of coaching by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, no, it's, but, it, but it's interesting, you know, when you talk to your kids, especially in the world of prep schools, about everybody thinks they're the star and everybody thinks they should be playing. And it's just like, trust me, I'm a guy who's lived through years of not playing and had to figure it out and, 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 and had to keep getting better. So uh, uh, um, I, I've used the story, but uh, not, not with Michael Jordan and me as parallel universes. <laughs> that's, that's not it. Right. Um... Tell me about after Malloy, where, where'd you go? Well, I wanted to go to St. John's and uh, my father wouldn't allow it because it was two blocks away from where we grew up. Mm. And his whole thing was, um, he paid for the Catholic high school, you know, for private high school. But in our family, you had to take care of your own education at, after college. So at the end of the summer, I ended up, uh, was offered a scholarship to go to Central Connecticut State University. And it ended up being a great, great place for me and and, and uh, I met a guy Bill Dietrich there who was just, just like coach Curran you know he, he was a guy who played ball at Central Connecticut and then stayed and coached there and was a lifer so I played for a lifer in high school I played for a lifer in college and lo and behold I became a lifer at my own facility and what got you from Central Connecticut State into coaching actually Bill Dietrich 
Okay. Uh, they, 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 run a, they run a camp at St. Thomas More called the Connecticut Basketball School, which was actually the longest running consecutive camp in the country. It was over 60 something years old uh, before last year got canceled because of COVID. And he was one of, he was one of the owners, him along with uh, Nick McCarchick, who was the first coach at St. Thomas More. And uh, um, right throughout the summer, you know, of course, like everybody, I want to keep playing. Uh, the team I was speaking to uh, folded. So they asked me if I wanted to teach and coach as I was a 22, 23 year old. And of course I didn't, but I was wise enough uh, to take it. And it's, you know, and I said, well, I'll take it as a temporary position. And um, every year it's temporary, you know, we'll, we'll renegotiate every, every year. See, so you've been here since 22 years old. I got, uh, yeah, I got the job wow. in 19, 1978. Wow. This, is, this is actually the sixth different decade I've coached kids. Now, being at St. Thomas More, why don't you give people tuning in kind of a brief overview? Give, you, give the elevator pitch of St. Thomas More. If I'm a basketball player looking at five prep schools, why should I come to your place? Well, the neat thing about St. Thomas More and the neat thing about all the different prep schools in New England, it's uh, um, they're all kind of different. And St. Thomas More, A, is a single sex. Uh, B, it's small. See, it's kind of a structured and disciplined place. Actually, the intrigue of, about a quarry is, you know, St. Thomas More, uh, now everybody wants to be in a bubble. Well, St. Thomas More was in a bubble long before it became vogue to be a bubble. So we, we were in an isolated place and kids came here to really just work on their game and work on their academics and go on to college. It's, it, it's a tool, you know, you, you take as a postgraduate, you're taking a year of your life to refocus every aspect of, of who you are. And it, for the kid who's committed, I don't know if there's a better place because you know we're a place that opens the gym every morning at 6.30. So if kids want to work out, they can come for two hours before school. And then we collectively hang out with our kids from three o'clock to five o'clock. And then our weight facilities are open from like six to 7.30 every night or the gym's open. So our kids really, I mean, really, 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 the whole program is to kind of get kids prepared uh, to live the life of a college athlete. And, and, and that's really how the St. Thomas Moore has really set the whole program up now, especially now, because we've gone through some changes in the last few years. Yeah, what are some of those changes? Well, what we're really doing with our postgraduates is, is, is all our kids have, are, are taking eight classes. Five of them are college prep or college credit, and three of them are sports specific. So, uh, you know, a basketball player could be doing strength and conditioning, flexibility, uh, individuals of three of their eight classes. So on a Monday, you may be, you may take an English, a math, an individual, and it's at a college credit. And then the next day, you would take, you'd wake up and do a strength and conditioning program, and then you'd go back and do a college credit history program, and then you'd you'd work on fitness and uh, and flexibility, and then you'd go back and take a college seminar kind of course. And what we've really tried to do, Corey, is make it very similar to what a college athlete does where you know they get up and there's a workout in the morning then they go to school and oh then they have an individual and then they go to lunch and then they have classes and then they come back to practice so what we're really trying to do is make it similar for those kids so that they can live that kind of life right who are you partnering with for your college credits university of connecticut oh that's it's great yeah it's all through university of connecticut and 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 for the pg it's you know most kids are leaving with six or nine credits you know from us which is really kind of neat and for those who need remediation we have that and you know kids uh can certainly take the courses that they like to take but you know we, we recently and historically have always had a pretty good student so you know if they can get a little head start on the college process you know that's a good thing yeah absolutely now i know last year i talked uh, to taylor who's your your, mm -hmm. your other team's coach about you know potential client and this seems to be a model that some schools are doing, which is starting a second team. Um, talk to me about, or, you know, I want to find out how you define that one and who you think that team is for and how it benefits them. Because I know now it's so much demand being placed on the prep school right. world. Schools like yourself are looking to potentially add a second team and some have done it. So tell me your pitch well, we, on that. We've had one in the past you know, 20, 25 years ago when, when prep schools really started getting a revitalization and, you know, more kids were looking into it. We've done that in the past, but we used to call it an A and a B team. Hmm. You know, now, you know, some people call it a national and a prep team. You know, our second team with Taylor uh, is, is a compilation of high school seniors and juniors and postgraduates. 
And honestly, Corey, the way we've tried to set it up is, uh, you, you know which team you're on before you come. And like we've, you know, the, our second team has some division one kids. There's some talented young kids and they have some very good postgraduates. So, uh, uh, and this year with the influx of kids, what we're really trying to do is set up two teams before they come. You know, as I said, we just don't think it's fair to, I don't have, well, some other people may do it differently, but at the same time as more, we're going to set it up where kids who decide to come early, they will be on my team and kids who can't make a decision. And uh, they'll be on the second team. They'll each play 30 something games. You know, they each have the same facilities. They each have the same academic programs. They each uh, will work with them as much as we possibly can. We have myself and actually four alumni coaching these guys, coaching these guys up. So uh, uh, it, it, it's going to be well done. I think for a lot of other schools, it's new for them. You know, like a Brewster Academy in Northfield and Herman, they're all looking at which and then they're all looking into doing these things. But it's something St. Thomas More has done in the past, and it's something St. Thomas More has been comfortable with doing in the past. We took a little hiatus for the last five or six years. Uh, but, you know, the pandemic has kind of not forced us into it, but kind of guilted, guilted us into it because there's so many kids who need a hand. And you, you know, and I know, Corey, you're in the business. You know, it's, it's just a raw deal for these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, and this year's a raw deal. And so is next year going to be a raw deal. You know, it, it's not going to it's not going to be over right away, you know, because it, all these kids who want to come do a postgraduate year. Well, all the seniors are going to have to compete against them as well. So there'll be more senior. I mean, th this is something that's going to hang around, you know, that's going to hang around and, and be with us for a few years, for a few years. So, you know, one of the main points of a postgrad joining a school like yourself is college placement. Mm -hmm. So if you've got postgrads on your team and you've got postgrads on Taylor's team too, that's a lot of bandwidth there and a lot of phone calls we make, and especially in this new environment. So is that changing what kind of kid you're taking for next year's team at all? Unfortunately, what it's doing, since there's so many kids who are interested in it, it really becomes, uh, you know, prep schools are tuition-based facilities. So uh, uh, <laughs> tuition comes into Tuition certainly mm -hmm. comes into everything, especially because, you know, we've lost such a, 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 a market for which is the international kid who historically has paid a little bit more money than the domestic kids or historically is more comfortable paying more money than the domestic kid. And they don't necessarily I'm not talking about necessary athletes. You know, some of these kids are non-athletes, but we've lost that market. So now, you know, these kids have to pay <laughs> some tuition, you know, kids for for us, at least, you know, kid coming for a. Uh, uh, a little bit of money is just not an option, you know? So it, 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 it's, that being said, if, if they're a scholarship level kid, you know, their one-time investment for a prep, prep school is, is not a bad thing. Um, but it, 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 that's the kind of kid we're looking for. You know, a kid whose family has some fiscal substance and, and, and a kid who's totally driven. Because as we all know, everybody's looking at video on these kids on, for most of these kids is what they did a year ago. And it's quite mm -hmm. silly. You know, it's quite silly. And the biggest thing is, is, is historically colleges didn't even like to look at highlight video, videos. But so many of these videos you're getting of kids in games, the competition in contrast to what you get in prep school is just so night and day. Like even our pickup games, you know, we're dealing with everybody in our program as a college level player. Either Division One, Division Two, and Division Three, and Division Three basketball players are really talented kids. You know, they're really, really talented kids. So tell me this, say you're getting multiple emails every day. And let's assume for this, this question that everyone can afford to pay tuition to go to your school. From that, what are you looking for now in this COVID era? What are you looking for? Honestly, we're looking, kids, we're looking for kids who want to take a chance on us and, you know, take a chance on themselves and really who really, really want to work. Because uh, uh, we're very transparent on the kind of kids that we bring into St. Thomas More. And this is who St. Thomas More is. This is what we're looking for. And we're looking for kids who uh, are willing to work. And we're also telling kids they need to be patient. You know, historically, you know, this, this year, typical in September and October, we'd be fortunate enough to have, you know, 150 colleges come through our doors. And you, you know, we miss, we miss seeing, we miss seeing yes, you. you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, and, and everybody has their own journey when they go through this postgraduate process. You can't compare yourself to, to your teammate. Uh, um, you know, what we, what we've always promised to do is we, we're not, our whole success is based on college placement. 
That's right. You know, we're going to coach to win. Of course, every every coach coaches to win, but it isn't the uh, end all with what we try and accomplish. I mean, our early success is based is when everybody's into a school. And the one thing about us is, you know, as a parent and as a coach, I've always been very comfortable being honest with kids. You know, and, and this is the level that you should play at. And, you know, even with my own children, I have four of my own children, one play division one and three play division two. So when I look at some of the players I have and they said they'd like to be a division one player, I said, yeah, I understand. But right now, these are your opportunities and these are the really things and these are the directions you should put more in, especially this year. You know, we're telling some division one kids who have division two opportunities, they should take them because I think a destination, I'm sorry, is not as important as an opportunity. You know, I mean, the, 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 there are fewer scholarship opportunities this year. So if you get the opportunity, take advantage of it and enjoy it. So what, so right now, I'm guessing you still have guys that have not been placed on your current team, right? Correct. Right. So what are you doing for that uh, at St. Thomas More? Are you calling people? Are you emailing coaches? Are you live streaming practice? Yes, 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 and yes. You okay. know, I, you, you, we're actually working a little harder this year on the phones and reaching out than we've had to in a long time because historically these people would come watch us play. Now we have to reach out to them. The Division Two people seem to be a little more receptive than Division One people. Division One people all seem to be holding out and waiting on uh, first to find out what their present seniors are doing, and secondly, you know, the transfer the transfer portal has been become such a huge thing with colleges. So, uh, but uh, we we uh, we've been really fortunate. I mean, in the fall, we actually had eight uh, uh, competitions. Where- and we right. played four different teams on two different times back to back. And each competition we did at 60 minutes. So when you look at it, we've actually had a total minute wise of 12 games. Uh, we've live streamed every one of our practices. We've live streamed every one of our games. We have video of everything for the kids. Uh, we, our objective was gonna, we were gonna be proactive rather than reactive. So we have stuff for all the kids now. And it's really kind of interesting, Cor, because some of the things that we're now doing is like, well, that works. But, you know, we're going to keep it. You know, it, it, it's OK. You know, uh, a pandemic, you just have to find different ways to find success. You know, and so uh, when you cor- when you live stream your practices, you choreograph them differently than uh, mm. because <laughs> the cameras follow the ball. So it's like you've got 15 balls going on. And, it doesn't seem to work as well. So you have to be a little more creative and a little more inclusive. And uh, and that's been kind of neat. You know, it's been kind of neat to kind of switch things up and see if they work. Well, also live streaming too. Your coach or your kids never know if the coach of their dream school is watching them at any given minute. Well, you know, that's what's so great about it. You know, we've been, as I said, we've, we've alluded to the fact that a lot of coaches used to come to the gym and one day they'd be 20 and the next day they'd be like two. And the energy when there's only two there uh, uh, wouldn't be as great as the day before. Mm-hmm. And you'd bring the kids in and say, hey, 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 you only need one scholarship. This could be it. You don't even know who these people are. You don't even know who's, they may, been look, they may be looking for one of their peers and you know they're going to another gym. So it's really important to give it all. And that, that goes back to the kind of kids you, you mentioned who you like to bring in. And we want a kid who wants to give 100%, 100% of the time. Gotcha. Now, since you've been at St. Thomas More since 1978, you see some changes in the basketball world, the prep school world. How are kids different today than they were in the late seventies? I think kids are so great. And I, I think kids still want to be coached. I think, you know, if you, I think kids want to rise to the level of expectations that you put on them. Um, I think kids have some more people hanging around them. You know, they, they have more people where, where there was a time in my life where they would just listen to me. But now if I say something that they're not happy with, they try and get to somebody else. It's like the divorce parent syndrome. You know, they, there's, there's, there's an AE person that they can reach out. Um, I, and the other thing I think of is what you now have to do is talk to kids individually more. You know, where I used to be able to tell 12 kids, this is what we're going to do. And now I'll tell 12 kids, this is what we're going to do. And then I'll have to go back and just grab like five or six of them and just reiterate that, no, it's really important. This is why we're doing it. You, you just seem to have to explain. The kids want things to be explained to them, which is fine. You know, you're just spending just a little bit more time with the kids. And then, but the, at the same time, you 
have to have them recognize it's still not going to be a democracy. You may not like the decision I'm going to make. I'll explain the decision why I'm making it, but it's it's absolutely important that kids recognize the direction that they are going in is the coach is going to run the show. You know, the head coach is going to decide who, who he plays, uh, where we try and play all our kids, you know, and, and, you know, but the next step, that's not necessarily the case because they have to win. You know, we don't have to win here. We like to win, but we don't have to win. You know, we're not going to get hired or fired or raised, you know, we have a raise because of all wins. It just doesn't happen. And I think prep school coaches, certainly in New England, understand that. You know, they understand the whole thing is you, our job is to, you know, increase skill level. Our job is to increase academic potentials. And our job is really, really, really to prepare kids for the next level. And you, know, you, you really see the one interesting thing about prep school kids is they don't transfer as much as, you know, they have some. But prep school kids can get comfortable where they go a little easier. You know, they're not the kid. Prep school kids as a collective group aren't the kids who's flying out of the other following year. You know, the guys who give their coaches a chance a little bit more. Because we as a collective group seem to have, you know, a better feel for these people and know where kids can play. Because certainly in our level, it's, you know, I know you spoke to Witten Jace. These are all people who have done this a while now. You know, and and and, and uh, the reason you can stay where you're staying is, 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 is because you have a history of being successful with kids. And that brings me to another question. Since you've been there so long, since you've coached so many good players at every single level from high major down to high academic D3, I'm guessing in the old days, could you make a phone call and place a kid pretty easily, almost based on your word? Was it ever that uh, easy back in your day? Yes. I, we used to work with Southern New Hampshire uh, uh, who went to the uh, NCAA every year and a coach by the name of Stan Spiro. And I would just give him a call and I said, well, what do you need? He said, well, I need a power forward. I got it for you. All right, Quinny, tell him he's scholarship. He's all set. And for some kids, that was, that was it. You know, a lot of kids come to prep schools and all they want is a scholarship. So we're all done. And uh, it's actually kind of interesting. A lot of the assistants I would call up and uh, say, hey, listen, you should take this kid. And they'd say, okay, we want him. Now the head coach has to do it. So now mm -hmm. these guys are now head coaches. And I'd call them up as a head coach and, <laughs> and they, they, they don't make this quick decision. It's like, I'm telling you this could be playing honest, honestly, Cor, if I get beat up, beat up for anything, it's probably because I'm going to put a kid in a level where he's going to find a lot of success. I'm not the guy who oversells the kid. I've never been the guy who oversells the kid. Those kids, I don't have to, you know, because everybody in the world wants that kid already. It's a kid who's a good low to mid who keeps saying, I want to go high. I said, let's send you to a good, you know, mid. And, you know, go to a place where you're going to win a ton of games. Because as you know, how quickly does a four-year go? It's just life, life, life moves so quickly. So historically, kids who are having success are happy kids. And they stay where they are. Now life has changed that recently, where the upper-level programs are looking at successful lower-level Division One kids. And those kids are now all moving. Which is, you know, if you were to ask me, that's one of the things that I just don't think is good for the game. But... It's happening, so you, so therefore you have to stay with it. Right, but I, I want to go back to this. You must be, it must be even more frustrating now that, you know, you could call a guy in the past and he would just take your word like, yeah, this guy's a good fit for my team and my level. And now in COVID, you're saying the same thing probably. In fact, you're probably giving some guys at lower levels some better players maybe than they'd normally get, and there's still a pause. Are you – is that frustrating to you right now? Are you experiencing that? Oh, it's 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 one hundred percent frustrating. Because uh, um, my my mentality is all all I'm really trying to do is help the kid out. But by helping the kid out, I'm helping their program out. You yeah. know, and and I, and I I'm never going to send a kid to a program where he's not going to find success. Because it doesn't help the kid, it doesn't help his family, he doesn't help the program, and certainly doesn't help my reputation. You know, it, n none of it works. So uh, uh, as I said, not trying to be repetitive. If I'm calling you, it's for a kid who's going to be good there. I'm not calling you for a kid who's going to be a stretch. I, I, I've never tried to stretch our kids there. It's just like, hey, this kid has a chance to be really good. And we have a few kids right now uh, that I've made some phone calls on. And, you know, it's like, all right, Quinny, we'll get back to you. It's just like, you know what? Uh, the first person who's going to take him, I'm going to, take, I'm going to keep making phone calls. I thought he'd be really good for you, but I'm... If you're not ready to commit, I, my job is to get these kids' commitments this year, and especially in a year where there aren't as many commitments. 
And uh, and then the next thing is like, you know, the, the kid, you have to convince the kid, no, this is the, this is the right thing to do. Because, you know, they have, you know, they have aspirations as well. You know, and as I, and we're saying it, it's a tough year. It's just a tough year. Are you, you having kids commit? Asper- I'm sorry, are you having well, kids yeah, commit that aren't even visiting schools or are they actually visiting? You can't, right. I mean, and one of the things that, you know, I'm fortunate enough to say, there's not too many campuses I haven't been on. You know, just, you know, doing this as long as I do it. I mean, Corey, when I first started this whole business, we played 35 games and 30 of them were college JVs. Mm-hmm. You know, so you'd get three or four home games. You know, prep schools have only become a big thing in the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years. But the first 20 some years of this, it was just, uh, you know, I, I'd call up the guys who were coaching Harvard and say, who's your big game? Well, we got Duke coming in. I said, okay, okay good. I got the JV big game. Yeah, you do? So they play, you know, they played eight, we'd play at 5.30 and, you know, we were doing it at all the Ivies and, you know, in New England, no, anywhere from, you know, uh, Naval Academy all the way through the East. And, I mean, we were in North Carolina, we were Virginia, we were at Old Dominion. I mean, we used to play some great JV, <laughs> great JV program. We'd go down and play Fletcher Arrow down at Fork Union and sure. we'd spend a week down there. Yeah, we'd spend a week, who was, you know, was like a mentor. We'd spend a week down there you know, would be in his tournament or play him two nights and then would hit, you know, all the way up, you know, all the junior schools and some DC schools. As I said, back in the day, I mean, we were at Georgetown, we were at American, we were at um, Maryland and Virginia. It's just like, and that, yeah, honestly, Corey, that's when kids found out how good they were because we'd also stop at division two programs and division three programs. And it's just like, hey buddy, you struggle against <laughs> their JV team. How do you think you can go there? You know, I mean, kids were allowed to become a little more realistic because they see things on TV and, you know, they don't quite pick it up. You know, it's right. nothing like being in a live game. And, you know, then Title IX kind of threw all the college men's JV out the window. You know, that's when that all happened. No, I'm not complaining about Title IX because I got two daughters who play college basketball. So, right. <laughs> I, I think it's one. I think it's wonderful, but it did hurt us. You know, it, it was really fun playing. Yeah, that sounds fun. That sounds. Oh, of course, it, it was absolutely fabulous, and and the kids loved it because we'd play and then stay and watch their games. You know, so it was just like really, really a neat thing. And New England, there were just so many schools. You know, that you could just be in within an hour or two. It was just. And the coaches, and then you got friendly with the JV coaches, who were also the assistant varsity coaches. And we met the varsity coaches. I, I jokingly say, when I, I've been doing this so long that uh, Jim Calhoun was coaching Northeastern when they were Division Two, and we played his JV team. You know, and so we've sent him kids at Northeastern, to Connecticut, and now at St. Joe's in, in, in the Division Three program. Gotcha. That's great stories. Um, let me ask you this. What would you tell a person, or I should say a kid, a senior right now, is thinking about prep school. Um, what would you tell a kid that maybe, um, well, let me ask you this. Who should not do a post-grad year? Let me ask you that. Honestly, I, 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 for men, <laughs> I men. think it's the best thing in the world. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, my two daughters didn't need one as much as my two sons. Um, you know, kids who have a very nice scholarship opportunity, I don't think need to go. You know, as I say, we, we'll have some kids sometimes who I'll say, well, what are your options? He says, well, I can, I can go to like Drexel or I can go to Lafayette. It's just like, well, what are you looking for? I'd like to go higher. I said, you know what? You should go to those places. And I, you know, I, I tell them right off the bat, you have a nice scholarship opportunity. You should go to those places. The other kids who shouldn't come are the kids who don't really want to work hard. And if those kids who think it's going to be easy because it's not. Uh, Corey, as you know, you're going to have a team of 12, 13 kids and every one of them was the best player in their high school or one of the best players on their high school, one of the better players in the area. I mean, it just all the cream continues to rise. So when you get there, you have to recognize that, you know, you're not going to be the man and you're going to share the game. And and, and so if you're not willing to do that, uh, um, you'll get left behind quickly. Because if you're not willing to really, really work, it doesn't make sense. Because what's really nice about it, and I've always loved just coaching postgraduates, is that the difference between a 19-year-old postgraduate and an 18-year-old senior, seniors think they've got time. Postgraduates don't think they have time. So they are just so focused and so determined to you know, make themselves as good as they can possibly be. 
And so, as I said, the kids who shouldn't go or, you know, sometimes we have a kid who comes to us and, and you know, he has a place like uh, Dave Hickson and I used to laugh. There were three kids who visited with me who said they were accepted to Amherst. And I said, you should just go there. I said, I just can't visualize. Same time, it's more competing with Amherst. <laughs> I said, what did you? And they all went and they were all happy. And, you know, they all, they all had great careers, you know, as I said. So therefore, academic kids in great academic situations, I think those are the things you should take. Gotcha. Let's have an easy question. Not that question. they can give me a call. And we'll, they can still give me a call and we can have a conversation. <laughs> have a conversation. Have a conversation because maybe, uh, maybe that extra year, they're, they're a tweener. Maybe they'll bump up a level. You just Correct. never know. And then they can go to the Ivy League, as I said. But once you're in that, you know, academic uh, uh, alley, it's just like, no, stay in those. You know, stay in those. As I said, if you can get a little higher, you know, as I said. And those those tweeners are usually the kids who are 6'5", 6'6", 6'7", 6'8". If you're a guard, just go. Yeah, but some kids, you know, too, want to at least take that chance and just mm -hmm. bet on themselves and see what happens because they don't want to sit back when they're 40 years old and just lay in bed and think, what would have happened about you know, I given a chance? I think kids who do postgraduate are risk takers as it is. You know, as I said, not trying to be, they're, they're gambling on themselves, you know, and, and I love those kids who gamble on themselves. Uh -huh. But I love those kids who gamble on themselves who are willing to uh, have an open mind. You know, one of the things we also tell our kids, we have some kids who, who will visit us, Corey, every now and then, and, and um, they just being recruited by Division three schools. And, and I said, okay, well, we need to look at a bunch of things. They said, well, I'm not going to go to Division two. <laughs> I said, well, you should keep every option open. All we ask our kids is keep every option open. And if division two happens to be it, it's division one. These kids, when you come to our facilities, when you come to our league, you'll figure out where you can play and coaches will figure out where you can play because you're going to get exposure. People are going to see you play. And exposure is a two-sided coin. You know, everybody wants exposure, which means sometimes you can get exposed, you know, and everybody, everybody can score, but you know, can you defend? Uh, uh, and that's that's always the intrigue. Right. That's good stuff. Um, tell me about the biggest surprise you ever had as a player. Who can because you know, I'm as sure some guys, some guys you see on tape and you really don't ever see them play until they show up in August for your first open gym. So is there a kid that just honestly, Corey, I, I every every year there's a kid like that. You know, every year there's a kid, you know, because we never promise anybody a starting spot. You know, we've never promised anybody anything. You're going to earn everything. And every year there's a kid that is just like, I thought you were pretty good, but man, you're fabulous. Uh, you know, a, a good, a couple of them, uh, our kids uh, right now has actually made it into league. Like the kid, Utah Watanabe, who's, who's really, really made himself into a player with the Raptors. Like as a Japanese kid who couldn't speak English. Uh, um, and he was six, eight and 180 pounds, you know, soaking wet. But you could just see his enthusiasm a, for our language, for our culture, but for the game. And then another kid, Damian Lee, who, you know, was a low division one kid and just, you know, he was on a national championship team with Andre Drummond and the two of them are just absolutely spectacular. But I'm just as impressed with a kid who, you know, makes himself into a fabulous division three player. You know, the, you know, it, 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 that that's for me is as rewarding as a kid who was all division threes and, you know, he comes and he signs with a division two program, you know, it's just like everybody is equally important. Uh, um, so I, 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 and, and honestly, um, my whole world revolves around by the end of the year, can we just look at each other in the eye and say, Hey, I gave it my best. You gave me your best. I've always been transparent. I've always been honest. We can always have a conversation. Uh, uh, you know, there have been a couple of bumps, and I've have I made some mistakes? Oh, sh sure, but I never have a problem with apologizing when I make a mistake. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's uh, honestly, it's just all the kids. You know, we have such a relationship because I'm always I am a guy who likes to talk to kids. I am a guy who likes to bring them into my office. You've been to the office. It's all couches and rocking chairs, and you know, St. Thomas More is a community-based school. And there's no distractions, so you know we're always around with these kids. So, so uh, uh, it would be really challenging to just pick one. 
uh, because annually, and I mean, it is our, our biggest successes, as I said, when we get everybody head care. Gotcha. Now, without naming names, what's one of your, give me a situation where you had a kid come in and it just didn't work out. Like what led to that? And what's, what's been kind of your biggest disappointment in a player? I think kids who are, the, kids are pretty much up who they are, where they, wherever they go. And, you know, intermittently we'll have some kids who'll just say, you know, it's not you or it's not the team, but you know, this isn't for me. And it, it's the kid who's really dealing with homesickness. Who's the, it's the kid who's had life pretty easy. And he, he doesn't, he does want to deal with the challenges of uh, coming off the bench, you know, as I said, and, and, you know, we try to switch the starting lineups, but every once in a while, there's some kids who actually think, you know, they're going to be a division one player and they have a division three body. And, you know, they come to see me and I said, listen, you know, we've opened the weight room every morning and we haven't seen you. I, and it's the kid who just, for us, wasn't really quite aware of how competitive uh, prep school basketball is mm -hmm. and how hard it is to be good and how much time is spent, you know, being good. And those are also the kids historically who are not going to be able to handle college because if you're not going to put the time in in prep school, the time that people demand in college is exponentially greater than even prep school. So I, those are the kids, you know, I, 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 who just find out how, how hard it is. And it's historically kids whose bodies need some, some physical development and they don't want to spend the time in the weight room. And let's be honest, you know, lifting weights isn't a fun thing, but it's, it's certainly a means to an end. And we always get a kick out of it because we always like when people look at our team in September and then they see us in March and April, they ask me if those kids are on steroids. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, <laughs> they just, they were, you know, that's why they're that good. And we do some uh, uh, tests with them when they show up to show them how, how, how much they've improved from September through November, through January, through March and then April, we just, you know, see what you can do, what, you know, what work does to kids and how it helps them improve physically. Gotcha. Okay. You did an excellent podcast this summer with Jeff Goodman. And you were with a round table with Jason Smith and Whit LeJour. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and some of those other legends of the prep school basketball world. Take me back. And, and I know this is going to be a tough one to narrow down, Jerry, but maybe you can pick one out. But one of the most memorable games you had, or the best team you ever coached against, not JV or college wise, but in the New England prep school world or like a Fork Union or Hargrave. You know what? Uh, it's it's fascinating because the, the, there was uh, uh, I remember going down and playing a um, Fork Union team earlier in my career when I had a kid Kenny Williams that went to North Carolina and it was like I, oh my goodness that team is fabulous and then in the same tournament we lost to Fork Union in the first round and then New Hampton played a Whit a Whitley Shore coach team in the second round and it's just like they were good. And then, and then you, you, you come up and, and you play a max good team from Maine Central Institute. Every time you turn around, you know, they, they're great teams. Actually, the most uh, enjoyable game I had with Tom Kinchowski, who, uh, you know, is a legend in his uh, uh, profession. He said the best prep school game he's ever seen was held at, in St. Thomas More in, on Martin Luther King Day in 1992. And he, he'll attest now a prep school game, not a high school game. And uh, um, it was a team when, Mac, uh, when Maine Central had won like 65, 70 games in a row. And we actually, since it was Martin Luther King Day, the place was packed. And we lost in overtime at the buzzer. When a guy, Johnny Rhodes, who goes to Maryland and, you know, has a cup of coffee in the league, it's a three from the corner. Um, and he was so deep, Corey, that he was out of bounds when we watched the video. Um, and our kids were all frustrated. But that kind of woke our kids up. And then we ran the table and we actually beat Matt in the finals of the New Englands uh, to beat their 79 game winning streak. But as a game, you know, people still talk about that game. And, you know, when you when you coach close to 14, 1500 games, you know, there's a ton of them, you know, certainly coaching my sons, that was a lot, a lot of fun. And one won a New England championship and one uh, uh, lost on a really tough desperation shot that they hit. It's like, oh my goodness. So, I mean, spending time with those guys was great too. But oh, every time you turn around in prep school basketball, 
there's another player, there's another player, there's another player. It's like, oh my God, yeah, we played against that kid. Oh my goodness. Because I, Corey, I'm the guy who just worries about St. Thomas More. Mm-hmm. You know, my assistant know everybody else. It's like, coach, remember that kid? No, no. Because I, I, I focus on us. I, I, I don't uh, focus on them. So when, when we do our pregame scouts, like I do us and the kids, my, my assistants, and, uh, and, and they do the opposition. And I know him as number 12. Like the, everybody right. knows everybody's in the no, Watch 12. It's like, you know what that is? Yeah, 12. That's what it is. It's 12. It's, it's, uh, so, and you know, in prep school, you know, I've never left St. Thomas More to recruit a kid. I've never been to an AA tournament. I've never been to a high school gym to scout. And there's no vanity involved with this. I'm just so busy. I'm not leaving the kids I have on campus who all decided to travel to come to St. Thomas More to watch another kid. Uh, you know, the only time I could possibly do it would be over the summer. And, you know, th- I think that's why you stay in prep school for, for, for June, July, and August, you know, because you need to leave. You know, it's, it's a tough job. You know, you're 24-7 for the nine months they're there. And when they go away, okay, we can Cadillac and relax a little bit. And, uh, um, so. When you're not coaching, what are some of your other hobbies? Well, I, you know, first, I'm a family guy. You know, so uh, my, my, my hobbies have changed. Like, I mean, I, I played competitive basketball until I was in my mid 40s. So I was in leagues all over the place. I, you know, I still love playing basketball. And then in my late 30s, I started golfing. So I enjoy golfing, but I'm an avid reader and I'm an avid guy. Uh, my, my wife's the best. So I spend gangs of time with her. And now we have our sixth grandkid on the way. So they've kind of monopolized everything. But I, uh, <laughs> I kind of, I'm a pretty structured guy where I have to, I like, I like to do about now work out every day. And when I work out, I can read, which is spectacular. And then, you know, I'm, I'm just a pretty much regimented guy, but it's, I like being outside. Like even in the winter, it's just like, I got to get outside for a while. Even today I took a walk and it's, this is a Nor'easter, but it's like, I got to be outside. I got to daily do something, something. So, uh, but you know, what's so neat about here is time goes so quickly because mm. you walk up to campus and there's kids, you know, and, and people ask me, you know, are you ever disappointed that you didn't go elsewhere? It's like, no, because every day of my life is, you know, kind of fulfilling, you know, because we're helping kids. What could be better than that? Yeah. Of the books you're reading this past, is any you can recommend that really stuck out this past uh past I'm actually year? reading, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things. I'm actually reading Michael Fox's latest book. And, you know, Michael Fox, you know, dealing with uh, uh, everything that he goes through, you know, with Parkinson's disease. And a couple of years ago, I dealt with this Guillain-Barre. So, and with the Guillain-Barre, uh, Joseph Heller wrote a book, uh, No Laughing Matter. So it's really about people overcoming obstacles. Yeah, Joseph Heller is the guy who wrote Catch-22. Catch yeah. yeah, you know, which is was a classic movie when I was growing up. But he actually dealt with Guillain-Barre. So he wrote a book about it. And that, that uh, autobiography is exactly the life I lived a couple of summers ago. You know, I was in the hospital for four months just dealing with some bizarre immune system thing. So, I mean, that's, I, 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 I like reading the biographies. Then I got John Thompson's book coming on. I got, uh, I got Barack Obama's book coming up next. So I always have a couple of books going. And then of course, when I'm on the bike, it's just silly mysteries. You know, I'll read all Harlan Coben's book and I'll, and I'll, and I'll read uh, Greg Isle's books and I'll read anything that just keeps me not paying attention to what I'm working out doing, you know, just so my mind takes me someplace else. Gotcha. Well, we're going to finish up here, uh, Jerry, but like, you know, you and I are out there a lot talking about the benefits of prep school and, you know, the difference between prep schools and basketball academies and who's it for and who's it not for and what it can do for you and what it can't do for you. Like, what do you want people to know that maybe just slips through the cracks about the prep school world or the prep school basketball world or the academics and the maturity? What's, is there one thing you kind of find over and over again that just no one talks about or no one picks up on that maybe they yeah, should? Yeah, I, I think the one thing that uh, I found is the kids who do the postgraduate here, we can even see it even in our own school, the success rate of our postgraduate in contrast to our graduating seniors. Their success in college is so much greater than most other kids. I mean, the NCAA has done loads of work with that. They're saying about 85, 86% of the kids are graduating college 
who play college sports. I just think it's such a great way to go through life. I think it prepares them for life so many, so many different ways. And I think if you can give, give yourself a, a heads up going to college, the postgraduate year is the perfect spot because there's so many nets. So if you need a little help, you need, you know, you make a mistake, we're just going to catch you and give you a hug. We're not, not going to lose our minds with this whole thing. So I, I, and when you sit back and talk to our alumni, which, you know, I've been really fortunate enough to do, most of the alumni will say, you know, coach, I went to prep school. I didn't really want to go, but I accepted that I was going to do it. And when I was there, I didn't love it all the time. But when I look at my life, if I don't know where I'd be without that, the, the postgraduate year has helped me so much more than anything that I've ever done in my life. It just prepared me. And they said, in your coaches, your blunt honesty was something that, you know, we didn't get in high school. You know, where, you know, <laughs> I just did a podcast with one of my ex-players at Terrell Dozier. And he said, I just couldn't believe this. He said, you know, here I am, you know, I'm a city kid and I get this old white guy, <laughs> this is what he said. I get this old white guy who's now like a father to me telling me, no, you're not that good. No, you're not this good, but you could be this good. You could do this. You can do anything you want, but there's always gonna be, you have to make a decision. You know, everybody has these dreams. It's just like, okay, now wake up and let's take the, let's look at the opportunities that are being presented today. And uh, um, they all said, right across the board that it, it's like the best thing they've ever done. You know, and it's funny because I've met guys who played for Wit. I've met guys, you know, now you, you travel around and you say, coach, I played against you when I was a booster and I played against you when I was at Worcester Academy and I played against you. And I, and they said, you know, your teams were always well coaching, always compared, but all your kids always seemed to like what they were doing. I said, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the objective. You know, that's the objective. That's great. Well, Jerry, I appreciate you coming on today, the podcast. It's uh, great seeing you again virtually. I'm sure I'll see you in person next season. <laughs> I hope to see you sooner sooner rather than later. And yeah, you're doing a great thing for helping these kids out. They, they actually need someone to kind of direct them in the sports field. So I, I certainly uh, appreciate all, the, all that you're doing for us. Oh, well, thank you for that very much. Thank you guys for tuning in again to another episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. We had St. Thomas Moore's Jerry Quinn on today. And uh, we'll see you again uh, next time for uh, another interview or some good nuggets and wisdom on the uh, prep school basketball world. Thanks so much.